morning, everyone in Europe, and uh, good afternoon in China and wherever you are in Asia. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, let me introduce myself quickly. I'm Laure de Carayon. I'm the founder of China Connect, which is a, a platform connecting uh, Western marketers with China's digital ecosystem since 2011 in Paris and, and also in Shanghai. And we help that make a presence on the Chinese web, actually, and connect with the Chinese globally. Uh, so what is China Connect Restart Live that you're joining today? We started in uh, April, actually, uh, back four weeks ago. Um, the decision was actually APAC uh, becomes the number one worldwide economic region in 2020, as you know. And China was the first hit country by the COVID-19 and is the first to start to recover. So all in all, uh, we felt really all the more necessary to share what experts on the ground uh, can tell us about their experiences and plans for the future, which can be actually extremely inspiring and useful for all of us in the West. But we know that many people in China and in Asia are also watching us uh, week on week. And thanks again. For the topic, China's gaming and esports unlocking a pandemic opportunity. So why this topic? Uh, actually, I think if you've been stuck at home, you kind of experienced what we aim to, to discuss today. So there they are more than 2 million uh, gamers in the world today, and a slim portion of it actually are interested in esports. Uh, gaming has seen a surge in downloads, surge in time spent, new profile of players during the COVID, and esports, which actually emerged you know, into a phenomenon uh, a few years ago, feelings hotels, arenas, and stadiums really already had a, you know, and driving players online. And it showed particularly uh, to be resilient during this crisis. So there are a few questions that our experts that I will introduce in a few seconds uh, will try to answer today, will contribute and help to answer today. What are the, some of the consumer and business perspectives of the Chinese gaming and esports market versus the West also? Can esports be, in fact, the industry uh, which is projected to account for more than $1 billion in revenue in 2020? Can this industry actually figure out a way to surge in the middle of a pandemic? And how brands can leverage actually the opportunity? Uh, so before we start, just uh, to remind you, uh, Take, don't forget to ask questions at the end, actually, of our conversation today. In the tab below your screen, you've got a Q&A tab. So you can ask the question there, and step by step, actually, we will um, you know, gather them for the end of the conversation. So now, uh, let me introduce our three guests. Uh, first, ladies first, Melody Lee from La Galera so Melody is the Director of Sales and Marketing at Lagarde Sports China, uh, the world's leading sports and marketing agency with a, a global network of local experts dedicated, actually, that's the mission of an agency to deliver innovative solutions to clients' needs. So welcome, Melody. Thank you, Laura. Hi, everyone. It's nice to be here. Thank you. Peter, Peter Wallman. Uh, Peter is the CEO and co-founder of Newzoo. Uh, worldwide leader in global games, esports, and mobile market intelligence, founded in 27, and uh, actually established in both San Francisco, Amsterdam, and Shanghai as well, with something like 30, 90 employees. Welcome, Peter. Hi, Laura. Good to see you again, and uh, having me on this stellar panel. You're welcome. Ajay Jilka. Culture Group, Ajay, is a British native that has spent the past decade working with some of the biggest brands, right holders, and game developers in Asia. He's based in Shanghai and is the lead executive in developing Nike's groundbreaking partnership with the League of Legends Pro League in China, which he will share a little bit more right after. So welcome, Ajay. Hey, guys. Uh, nice to connect and thanks for joining. Okay, so let's start right away. Peter, you're closely actually uh, monitoring the gaming and esports markets on a global scale. Uh, can you share some consumer and business perspectives, please? Yeah, sure, sure. Thank you very, uh, very much. I think there's, there's some beautiful cases uh, coming up of which the other panelists have been very actively involved in. I think it's my role maybe to provide a little bit of perspective and, because that's also what we... Um, especially now in these times, you know, spend a lot of time on providing a little bit more perspective of the options that um, 
brands and others have in the esports and gaming space. Um, so my first slide, if you can go back one, uh, Anina. Um, I spent late December in uh, in China actually as uh, the single Westerner participating in the uh, um, the games industry annual conference in Haiku Hainan, the tropical island um, there, and <clears throat> spending time there with the executives of of, of Ten Cent, smaller game devs, but also the government officials, um, was very very valuable and also underlined you know the desire uh, for global alignment uh, also from um, from China. Um, and 50% of the time, it was about overseas and um, doing more business there, having more partnerships. And I think that's a big, you know, a big theme that we as a games business sort of spearhead global alignment, where perhaps in other markets, um, that is a little bit um, slower because we're just completely uh, digital. If you go to the, to the next slide, um, you know, there's, there's three types of perspectives that um, that I can provide. One is more understanding the, the, the larger business perspective. Second one is um, the historic perspective and the trend perspective, understanding where games has come from. Um, that can help you uh, think up the future. And the third one is the consumer perspective, you know, seeing that in a little bit of a bigger light. The first one, the business perspective, everyone should realize that the games business is usually successful. It's an enormous uh, business. You know, generating $160 billion this year, that's more than the professional sports business. Um, the business of esports is still relatively small, but the engagement that esports has, you know, of close to half a billion people already watching professional gaming is enormous. Um, but we should see that as part of the total uh, game or game enthusiast ecosystem, that's almost 3 billion people. The business realized that, that, that they are successful and they are continuing to be successful in these tough times. So what you see happen in, in, in the West is a lot of embracement of, of sports, of gaming, a lot of convergence of that, and often for, for charity to help, to help people get through this tough time. So like famous uh, celebrities, tennis stars, participating in a Mario tournament, something you couldn't imagine happening only weeks or months ago. And in China also, uh, Tencent and other huge tech giants have, um, have allocated part of their profits uh, to uh, ship PPE, to ship masks around the world, uh, ByteDance, Tencent. Um, so the success from a business perspective comes with large responsibility. And I think the games companies um, realize that. And at the same time, you know, there, there's new launches of games, uh, a Valorant attracting tens of millions of gamers as well as viewers um, that is equally successful in China as in the West. And then we see other aspects of gaming like Animal Crossing, usually successful in the West, so popular also in the East that when something, um, political statements are being made in the game, that draws attention of, of politics. It, it's a big responsibility to be in the games business um, at this uh, moment. And I think the companies involved are, um, are realizing that and picking that up and on a completely global uh, scale, and on the next slide, you, you, you can see that the, um, where we used to have games being developed in China, games being developed in the West, each serving their own market, this is becoming increasingly mixed. <clears throat> and I think one of the perfect examples of that is that two of the most talked about popular mobile games in the West at this moment, Archero and Call of Duty Mobile, have been developed by Chinese studios. Um, and it, it, it shows that Chinese studios and game developers actually pioneered a lot of the business models that we have migrated to in the West. Uh, so the fact that the business is now embracing Chinese studios to develop their games um, just accelerates the alignment of game IP popularity and business across, uh, across the globe. Um, and I think that's a, that's a very uh, powerful thing to see. The second perspective is time. When I face big brands and tell them about gaming, uh, on the next slide, you can see um, sort of the history of games. And gaming earns a lot of money, but gaming has been successful because it chases engagement. It goes after entertainment hours and, and engagement hours of consumers. And it has innovated itself to then monetize that in, in all kinds of new ways. Looking back all the way to the history when we only had uh, consoles and, and there was no internet, you know, after that, this huge leap innovations every five years, 
have, have enabled games to grab more time. You know, mobile, you could play anywhere suddenly. So you could spend more time playing games. Let's make all games free, free to play. And then ask for money afterwards that everybody can start playing these high-end games. Huge innovation. Then a big innovation, which is a large part of today, is people are watching a lot of videos on YouTube and on the streaming services in China. Um, that's actually part of our core business. It's not just a marketing tool. Why not add a professional layer there, just like sports? And esports uh, rose up from that as the shiny top of a huge pyramid of the success of viewing of games. And my personal opinion is that the next phase is to get people to um, be lifetime gamers. Um, I'm 49 years old. I don't play a lot of games anymore, but I watch a lot of games. I buy a lot of hardware. I'm a real fan of games. And I think that's the next thing that we're moving, uh, moving towards. And only, the only degree of freedom that we have to even gather more time uh, from people. And this is happening in almost the exact same um, in parallel in China as it is in the West now. And I'm excited to see that all be aligned. And then on the next slide, uh, I'm trying to illustrate that uh, because of all these changes and innovation and global alignment, the types of people that the games business entertains has broadened out enormously. Um, we used to talk about core gamers on console, predominantly male, casual gamers on mobile, predominantly uh, female, and that was about it, core or casual. But we have people now um, that hardly play any games, but watch a lot of games, spend games on esports uh, merchandise, for instance. So we have to take a new look at the consumers playing games. And with around two thirds of the online population in the world playing games, of course you have more than two personas. So this is what we feel responsible for is, is helping games companies and brands understand which of these personas fits their brand best. Um, and on, on the next slide, you can see that, that how, these, how these different types of persons, they can differ even per region. China has a way longer heritage in competitive online gaming uh, than the West actually has. And you can see that in, in um, the engravement of gaming in, in the Chinese culture, that they have more people that are, you could call core gamers or ultimate gamers, as we call them, uh, for whom gaming is a real part of their daily life and what they, uh, what they strive for. And that's different in, in the West. And of course, if, you're, if you look at individual game titles, like a Candy Crush here at the bottom, there's a completely different person that that appeals to with a different motivation to play that game. And we're trying to, um, yeah, to bring this to brands and outsiders of games to help them understand who they will be reaching when partnering up with um, the different IPs available in the gaming space. If you go one, uh, one step further, um, back to the responsibility that, that gaming is, is taking, if, you are considering uh, doing something with games. Um, I always motivate people to look a little bit deeper at the individual mechanics that have been successful. You know, streamers, um, influencers started off streaming games. All the business models around it are about voluntary gifting. It's not surprising that charity initiatives from the streaming space and gaming space are more successful than those on TV because the whole ecosystem and the communities there, if people trust uh, the person organizing, are more used to contributing in little amounts of money, for instance, just practically. And you already can see mechanics accelerating into other businesses, music being an obvious example, that now Spotify allows people to contribute money uh, to their favorite band, just to help them through this crisis. And I think uh, brands and other companies can uh, take a deeper look at games, and identify mechanics that can help them um, help them grow and maybe be different in these new times. Um, and how brands approach it and which brands are leading, I think that's a, a key thing that my co-panelists are, are going to show with, uh, I think, a couple of the coolest cases uh, in the world. Uh, back to you, uh, Laura. Thanks very much, Peter. Uh, thanks a lot. Um, Melanie, um, well, this, the, the current situation actually uh, I've seen obviously you know, plenty of sports events cancelled or uh, at least delayed uh, and they've taken the money you know, out of live sports to invest on esports. Uh, 
if the opportunity actually seems clear, uh, there's a surge of in audience, like for many other uh, business industries, but a drop in advertising. <laughs> That's also the biggest surprise, but uh, ongoing. And it seems few decision makers really truly understand the space. I mean, just Peter, you know, helped us, you know, understand the, the, the variety and the scope of profiles of those users. But can you give us uh, uh, the big picture of the ecosystem in China, APAC, and also versus the West? Uh, and then I think you introduced the partnership that you just announced between BMW and T1. So go ahead, Melody. Sure. Um, thank you very much, Laura, for your question. I guess um, for me to um, answer this question, um, the difference between um, China or APAC with Western in terms of ecosystem is quite a, a grand question. Um, for us at Lagada Sports, given that we are a focused sports related and esports related marketing agency, I would like to take on this question from a commercial pers perspective. And um, Anina, if you are, if you could please um, switch to the slides. Um, so from, from our perspective, we would like to kind of a tackle and answer Laura's question from um, these five perspectives that our um, viewers could see on the slides. If we see it from a commercial perspective, from, from the business and capital and tournament and game, uh, literally um, in China and APAC, we could see this huge co competition for capital, for media partners, media broadcasters, and for major sponsors to try to get into the game to get into the game, even though we could see the whole esports or gaming industry is still in a kind of um, um, growing, growing phase. While we see in the Western world, it is more mature and established. Take business as an example, if you could see on the slides, we, we saw that, um, take Bilibili as an example in China, um, Bilibili was able to win the bid to become the, uh, the China regional um, media broadcaster of League of Legends, uh, competing, um, uh, competing against uh, other platforms like, uh, like Huya or Douyu. And the, the deal amount ex exceeded like almost RMB 800 million um, for, for three years, uh, for three years ex uh, span. While on the other side from uh, on the Western world, we see um, the whole like broadcast uh, landscape has already been settled, but we see more and more premium brands like uh, Pringles, like uh, SAP, uh, like, like BMW, uh, like KitKat are trying to get into uh, and already have a spot and a position in the esports system. Um, a, second, a second example that you can see on, on the slides is capital related. Everyone knows that now we have 17 League of Legends clubs in China. And now with the last spot um, being competed, uh, being competed and bidded against, uh, which might happen next year, uh, as far as we understand that the, the minimum bidding price for that last seat to have your uh, League of Legends club, uh, club to compete in China is uh, at least 90 million RMB. But on the other hand, if you see in the Western world, um, a Danish uh, esports organization called Australia Group, uh, under this group, they have um, three uh, esports clubs. They're already successfully being listed on, on, um, in the market. So you can see that the two markets in the East and in the West, in China and APAC perspective, capitalists are trying to get in major players like um, big um, live streaming platforms are trying to get in, um, but on the other hand, on the Western world, you see um, the commercial uh, commercialization has been pretty well established with more and more premium brands trying to get a place in. But uh, regardless, if you can see some numbers at the end, at the bottom of the slide, you will see, uh, even though China is still kind of climbing up the hill, but the whole uh, economic scale of the esports market in China actually consists almost 50% of the global esports revenue. Just to, uh, for this to give you a grand uh, picture of how, in our pers perspective, how China versus the Western world um, is positioned in this esports um, um, era. Uh, next slide, please. Laura, back to you, please. 
Well, uh, you, you, yeah. you can go ahead actually in introducing yeah. precisely you know, the partnership that you just announced uh, between BMW and mm -hmm. T1. Um, yes, and um, thank you um, for uh, mentioning the, uh, this announcement that we just did uh, globally between T1 and BMW. And uh, what we would like to share with all our viewers is actually for a premium non-endemic brand like BMW, their decision to enter the world of esports was not done um, like uh, at a glimpse of a time. Um, actually, the, the, the um, how to say the uh, trust uh, on uh, uh, the how to say the ambition objective to embrace the world of esports actually dated back as early as almost three years ago. Um, if you can see on the slides, you will see some cool pictures from the, um, uh, the actually the LEC summer split final that was actually dated back in 2007 uh, with uh, our support, uh, our European colleagues was able to get BMW on board for that event almost three years ago. And we, actually uh, helped BMW to create this digital campaign called Lane to Paris. And we actually had a very cool BMW car on site at the summer split finals for an artist to do like spray painting on the car. So with that as the foundation, as the basis, that actually paved the way for BMW to really understand the, the new world of esports and the huge potential uh, the consumers and the fans of esports could bring to the brand globally. And um, back to you, Laura. Well, I think you, you, yeah. you can move forward, in fact, yeah. uh, you know, into what, did, what else did you do into this, uh, you know, esports related business? Um, yes. Um, actually, for us, I understand that uh, most of viewers uh, on the line today would like to know more about what's happening in the world, uh, what's happening in, in, in China in terms of esports. So the examples that well, I'm going to share here are focused on China market and how Lagada Sports China team have been doing. Um, uh, if you can take a look at the next slide, please. Um, the, next, the next one as well. Next one, please. So we were pretty proud to see how BMW announced all of those um, a partnership. Can you go back to the video so that we, we are on par with what Melody uh, just said? Thanks. Thanks very much. Go ahead, Melody. Sorry. Yes, the video that um, Anita played earlier was the video that BMW proudly announced on, on their social media platforms in China, I think like only half a month ago, proudly announcing their partnerships with five esports clubs globally. And what what we were really proud of was um, a lot of sports we played um, um, a pretty supportive role in supporting BMW in narrowing down uh, on their um, esports related assets acquisition globally. So, so BMW came to us um, actually end of last year and saying they really would like to embrace the new era of esports. And based on the successful example, successful um, a deal that they did three years ago uh, in Europe, they really would like to do something bigger um, globally. Uh, and that's why we actually helped BMW in ident identifying in which area they needed to um, actually invest in. So in the end, we identify five clubs in the end because, we, because BMW wanted to achieve number one, high uh, connectivity with the esports communities globally in different markets and different regions. And number two, the passion that, um, uh, that BMW could bring uh, to, all of those uh, to all of those communities uh, that actually are behind those five clubs. So the, the video that you saw was the annou announcement uh, partnership of the video, um, I think half a month ago uh, on the Weibo, just to give you a, a, a glance of it. Yeah. And then, yes, 
Go ahead. Go ahead on, on precisely on some other uh, partnership that yes. you've been dealing with. Um, um, if you can, uh, if you can click on the next slide, uh, we, I wanted to share with you some pictures here. Uh, I was sharing that uh, um, it would be good for, for me to introduce what we do in China in terms of esports. Actually, uh, the pictures on the uh, upper uh, left side was the, the event that we uh, did for T1 actually late last year, end of last year, right? Just before the COVID-19 outbreak in China. So um, as the uh, exclusive commercial partner of uh, T1 uh, globally, we actually invited Baker, who was the legend of a League of Legends uh, to, to China. And Baker was, uh, with our support, Baker was actually appointed and selected as the China and Seoul Esports Ambassador um, in Shanghai. And the picture on the upper right hand side was a very nice and uh, like a warm meet and greet uh, of uh, T1's two marquee players, Faker and Teddy, with the uh, fans in China. And then you see um, the pictures on the left uh, lower end, the partnership between T1 and, and Nike was actually very good to be mentioned because um, from a branding perspective, uh, Nike sees, uh, for, for Nike to select a premium um, sports assets, be it football, tennis, uh, or golf, or now esports, Nike sees T1 as the best of the best, one of the best um, esports clubs in the world. And the, uh, another objective from Nike is actually uh, the, uh, the, the fact that T1 has a huge fan base in China and in the Asia region. And that was why the partner was, partnership was sealed, actually, I think two months ago. And then the, the pictures on the, uh, 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 the bottom right hand side was a, a nice um, live stream game, game that um, our team in Shanghai actually did. Um, because we know because of the COVID-19 situation, uh, we, we, everyone really misses our sports and misses football. And we actually collaborated between a Bundesliga club called FC Augsburg and a Chinese football club called Taizhou Football Club. We did a FIFA 20 online live streaming on Weibo and YouTube, actually last Saturday, um, for two players from FC Augsburg and one Chinese player from Taizhou Football Club team to do a live competition. And that actually drew a lot of attention and people were really, um, we're getting excited because everyone misses football, everyone misses sports. And that actually played a, uh, played a very nice warm up to the final uh, return of Bundesliga actually this coming weekend. So we were pretty uh, proud of that small event that we, did, we just did. Thank you. Back to you, Laura. Thank you, thanks very much, Melody. Ajay, uh, culture yeah. group actually that uh, you're leading the, the operation in, in Shanghai is, um, was the lead executive in, in forging the strategic partnership between Nike, Greater China, and the League of Legends eSports property. Um, representing Riot Games and, and Tencent. So the first venture from Nike on league uh, basis in esports globally. Um, concretely, can you tell us, you know, how will, is and will the sponsorship look like actually since it's already started? Sure. Um, hey guys, I know this is probably your 10th Zoom call of the day for all the viewers watching overseas, but um, so I'll keep it quick. Ultimately, it's the same as what you're seeing that Nike do everywhere else with their league relationship. So it's a it's a head to toe relationship. So it's apparel, footwear, as well as a streetwear line. And one of the one of the key points of it is that they're going to be celebrating the teams like they would in other other leagues, like the NBA. Um, what's kind of unique about this as well is because they run obviously a new category for for the brand and obviously for traditional sports so inherently digital in nature so there's aspects of it that you wouldn't necessarily find within within traditional sports such as digital currencies goods as well as well as um live stream in, in game in game experiences which we'll talk about a little bit about later but ultimately it's around storytelling around the athletes um so that's really encompasses what we what we worked around with the swoosh as with with our client riot games so um if you're looking at the slide right now um peter talked about valorant and we we talked about animal crossing there's lots of different games out there our client riot games um they've released a lot of new new titles specifically on mobile at the moment 
Um, but the game we're talking about really right is around League of Legends. So it's the most played video game in the world. It's a PC game, and this is really the, the genesis of, of the journey. And then the next slide, if we go to that, Amina, was really the start of our journey, um, which my personal journey with going into this universe or, of League and, and what this means as a culture in China. And this started at the Birds Nest Stadium in 2017. So three years ago, before we're seeing the massive trend um, that we've outlined earlier on in the presentation, and this was more than 60,000 people gathering to witness a milestone in not only League of Legends history, but also China sports. So it's the biggest attendance since Usain Bolt won gold in Beijing Olympics in 2008. And the, the, the figures really speak for themselves. And obviously, we're seeing an upward trend. And this is really when we started the journey with, with Riot and Tencent. So the next slide, as we go on to it, we're talking really about the property. Um, Melody, you talked about like the league franchise, and at the time there were only 14 teams. It was the League of Legends Pro League is effectively like the EPL or the, the NBA um, in the sense that it's a franchising system with home and away structure. There's 14 teams, there's more than 140 athletes. It's split up into a season, so spring split and the summer split. And this was really the property that we were working with, with the guys at, at Riot at, at the time. So. We're going to the next slide. We'll give you a little bit more about the background for the brief and, and what were the objectives. So at that time in 2017, LOL was the lead, leading esports title in China, but it needed to develop that brand heat and mass popularity despite its market position. Dota 2 is obviously another key, a popular title in the market, but as, as brand itself, it needed to develop that brand heat. And it had three, the, the league and our clients had three objectives in mind. Um, to develop Main Street cultural relevance across all cohorts, specifically the youth segment, to drive incremental revenue for all LPL teams. So as a league, you would then distribute the revenue across the different teams as you would do in other leagues. Um, and then a first of its kind partnership with a global sportswear brand. No, no other esports leagues have ever gone about doing this. And this was really the brief that was presented to us. So we'll unpack a little bit more about how, what we learned about in the market before we built this proposition. So in the next slide, we'll talk about what we learned from the market. And there were really key three insights. If we go to the next slide, um, the three key insights were that the league itself really exhibited a lot of characteristics that were similar to other global sporting leagues, but it didn't have any merchandising elements such as the NBA or even domestic sports properties like the China Basketball Association and their association with leaning the Chinese Super League and obviously Nike owning that category. So that was one key insight that we that we found. And obviously in our market insights, we went to lots of different esports events. We we noticed we talked to consumers and um, we talked to fans and we noticed that at the nexus of esports and and the spectatorship, there was an emergence of, of streetwear culture in China, which we're which we're obviously seeing right now, and a lot of brands going into that category. And the third insight was that the teams, fourteen teams, had rapid rabid um, fan base that were sourcing their own merchandise, um, where they weren't necessarily going to outlets to purchase it, like like the T-shirt I'm wearing right now, but they're actually going on Taobao and online platforms to source that and express their fandom. And the second insight, if you go to the next slide, was really around idols, heroes, and icons. I'm I'm from the UK. I, I love football, and in football, there's idols, heroes, and icons. We found that, and we've spoken to a lot of the players and the teams as well, and the fans, and they really follow. Their fandom is really punctuated by their affinity towards these different people. So the idol is Clear Love. I think he's 23 years old now. He was once the number one ranked player in China, and now he's a He's the head coach of a prominent LPL team. Faker, as Melody talked about, is the Michael Jordan of, of League of Legends and really um, the, the top of his game. And he's still extremely young. And then the, the gentleman on the bottom left, PDD, is um, he as a former player, but has amassed this massive following in China and has become a celebrity in his own right. So we found that these three insights really developed a unique opportunity for, for our for the brands that we were going to speak to, and that's going to be talked about in the next slide. So, if the next slide, uh, if you go next, the opportunity was to own gaming and youth culture in China. So, you're probably familiar with all of these different faces, from the LeBron James to the Michael Jordans, if you're watching The Last Dance as well right now, and obviously Li Na and prominent um, Chinese athletes like Yi Jianlian. So, we we always look to these individuals as culture icons. So, musicians, be it from the Drakes all the way to the NBA stars. And the CBA stars have become arbiters of culture and cool. 
But in China, we found at that specific time that there was emergence of these new cultural heroes and sporting heroes, uh, which were gamers at the time, which we talked about earlier on. So where did the LPL and, and the League of Legends sit? It stood out as a dominant influence of culture for all the players and fans. So that's where we started and that's where the start of the journey. So if we go to the next slide, um, we'll talk to you a little bit more about the key milestones. It was a kind of a 12 to 20, a 14 month process. So the team here, we worked um, very closely with the guys um, at Riot and Tencent over a period of 14 months in the creative um, positioning around this new culture, this new category, a lot of education, approaching all of the major sports brands operating Greater China from the domestic ones all the way to the international brands. And really at each different stage in the year, we saw major um, performances on LPL teams on the global stage, and which culminated in, obviously in September time, we had three um, teams go to the world championships just before the Asian games in Jakarta, China wins gold in, in, mobile, um, in the mobile version of League of Legends, which is called Honor of Kings, as well as League of Legends. And that's what really um, built a lot of public awareness around this new sport. And then obviously in, in Incheon in 2018, we saw Invictus Gaming um, take the crown. And then at the end of that, we're coming to, to okay, we really want to align with, with the best. And this is when we really landed on the partnership. So the next slide will give you a little bit more of an overview of the start of that partnership and, and journey. The next slide. Um, this was really what Culture Group was born uh, and the genesis of the, of the company of the agency is to bridge the worlds of culture and brand. The founders of the company really had this vision that there's an opportunity in Asia, specifically when brands are understanding new cultures and areas of, of passion. And this was really the first like, where bridging these two worlds to, to leaders within their own categories and brands, which are going to go out there to define the new look of the gamer and the esports athlete. Um, what that looks like, will will add to your point, um, Laura, what does this sponsorship or, or not partnership look like? So the first uh, aspect of this, if we go to the next slide, is as we talked about, it's going to be really defining the look of the gamer and defining the look of the esports athlete. So if we go to the next slide, it's nice. all around LPL apparel. So the partnership led to the development of official jerseys for all of the teams, where, which were first unveiled before... Um, for the uh, Fun Plus Phoenix won the World Championships in Paris last year. And if you're looking at the bottom right picture of the two, two athletes running towards each other, this is the unique part of the partnership in terms of like, how do you, one of the key missions for Nike was to encourage movement. So they linked the Nike running club, um, NTC training app to the actual League of Legends app. So encouraging movement on, in, in the physical world would then unlock digital items in the game. And that was a really unique activation and that's what makes this partnership so unique. What was also unique about this, if we go to the next slide, is how we then go into mass culture and streetwear line, which is what the partnership also led to development of. So it's influenced the jersey that I'm wearing right now is um, was part of that skew and I'm sure that the guys are, are uh, Raya and Tencent are also have really exciting plans for, for the worlds that are going to take place at the end of the year. Um, so if we go to the next slide, we talk, we talk a little bit more about the results. So, okay, ultimately the, the partnership was the first of its kind, but what did it actually do for, for both brands and ultimately, ultimately the squish? So if we go into the next slide, it goes on to a bit more of the results of the campaign. So, Whilst there was a limited amount of merchandise, it had 100% sell-through rate. There were the launches of the um, in-game items, and that actually led to mass participation on Nike Run promotion. Um, in September time, we talked about when we actually launched the, the product. Um, and then, obviously, from then, we saw Fun Plus Phoenix win in Paris, and then promotions around singles days. And then just before COVID, unfortunately, hit, they launched the new LPL jerseys as well. 
Um, so what does this all mean in terms of where we're at right now? So how do, you, if we go to the next slide, what's, what's happened since we've launched the journey um, and we're turning crisis into opportunities? So if we're looking at the top left picture, there have been massive gains in LPL viewership from tra versus traditional sports. And so from 2019, LPL viewership of the spring split up until 2020 comparison, viewership has actually increased 40%. Um, within the first split this year, we've seen also growing explosion globally for four LPL sides qualifying for the World Championship. So the second picture of going anti-clockwise is Jindong Gaming. Um, they are the ninth team to actually win the the LPL championships, which also increasing competitive balance and raising the value of the franchise generally. And we're also seeing rising commercial activity driven by e-commerce platforms like Jindong, as well as content licensing deals around the athletes themselves. So in the middle picture, you're seeing um, a prominent athlete, uh, esports athlete called Jackie Love on the left-hand side um, being gifted a pair of Air Jordans. And then also this is part of a, a licensing relationship around his his journey as an athlete and the content that the brands can start creating around this during this very unique period of time. And the last, the last picture on the bottom right is actually what building off what um, Peter talked about, which is around the, the, the crossover between entertainment and esports. And this is a professional footballer called Gerard Piquet. He actually sent um, a note in, in advance of the spring split to Jin Dong on Weibo, which went, which was quite viral in a sense. And this is also going on to, okay, in the future, turning crisis an opportunity, what's happening, what's gonna be driving the business moving forward and opportunities for brands. And if we go to the next slide, we're really looking at the fact that what, if we go to the next slide, that esports is driven in every form or facet of entertainment. So three years ago, China, launched its first League of Legends variety TV show, which is now in its 10th season. Um, Esports generally has, its, and the league has its own original music. On the left-hand side, um, you're seeing the crossover between pop culture and K the rising popularity of K-pop culture and the development of new characters. This is a, a group called KDA, which obviously has their own Spotify lists as well. So that that is really what the opportunity in, in our perspective, in my perspective of where the future lies with esports, not just as a, as a competitive level, but also what is a lifestyle element which can draw more and more audiences around. Um, so the last um, kind of like page is really gives a little bit of a teaser towards what's going to happen in Shanghai um, at the end of the year. And then over to you, Laura. Thank you very much. Let's have, let's have a look. Thank you. Well, I, I really hope I'll be in Shanghai for the next one because, uh, I mean, honestly, the Accor Hotel Arena is something like no more than uh, 15,000 seats, I guess. And I know that Shanghai is going to be around in between 50 and 60,000 seats. So that should be just amazing. 
uh, actually, yeah, we'd better check in <laughs> quite in advance if, if there are such, uh, you know, control uh, things uh, to, to enter. Anyway, thanks very much. Um, well, a couple of minutes ago, um, Melody, you mentioned about those live streams that you did last Saturday on both Weibo and YouTube, actually. Uh, it's clear that uh, one of the latest trends that we're seeing is the growth of esports platforms on one side and on the other end, obviously, uh, streaming platforms in, in this stay uh, at home economy. Melody, uh, how will this uh, T1, you know, BMW uh, partnership uh, and beyond, actually, I would say, any kind of partnership, we leverage this live stream, which is not a hype tool anymore, I would say. And I think the COVID has shown, you know, how much it did expand across the industries, etc. But what is it? Tell us a little bit more about the strategy. I mean, and uh, and what you're going to do with uh, with this latest partnership. Um, sure. This is actually a very good question. Um, ever since the announcement, or ever since the kind of the contracting process with BMW, we've been in very um, frequent discussion with BMW uh, colleagues on how to support them to maximize all of their rights um, with with T1. And a lot of rights uh, were designed in a very bespoke and customized way to with the with the aim to really. Uh, support BMW achieving their goals in terms of marketing goals, reaching out to more uh, young generations uh, that have different content consumption behaviors. And everyone, um, if you can see the, um, the, the bracket on the slides, um, actually these are a, a very, uh, very rough and high level uh, summary of our discussions with, with BMW because for, for BMW, they would like to embrace the online communities and we were uh, discussing with them to divide their, um, their target groups to um, fans and consumers who, who uh, pay attention to comprehensive social media platforms like Weibo and WeChat and also those streaming media platforms in China like Bilibili, like Douyu and also a very vertical vertical esports and sports community like Hupu and also uh, like uh, Dongchodi, a uh, very auto-focused um, um, mobile applications. Just with this as an example, but in with our discussion with BMW, like one major topic that we we always come back with is that um, yes, um, we are now. Uh, kind of enduring this um, global pandemic, the COVID-19, and people usually say that actually um, our every aspect of our life has been changed and will continue to change um, after the COVID-19 period. And what we suggested or advised BMW to have and to keep it in mind is with all the activation of their rights with T1, they need to keep in mind on how to really uh, design and create content uh, of BMW in association with T1 to cater to uh, what those fans or consumers um, uh, uh, consumption behavior or their interest points across all of these platforms. So the, uh, the, the, to, to sum it up, if you want to really have a real unforgettable and unmissable connection with your potential target groups, you need to see and study deeply what they really would like to consume on a daily basis. And then you find that connections between your brand, in this case, BMW, and the, um, the, 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 the one of the best um, League of Legends clubs, T1, and then create content that can really benefit and provide value to your um, future clients. So in this way, we don't see the COVID-19 pe like situation period with um, a quarantine and um, working from home, social distancing as a hype tool. We, we, we see that um, people's behavior, people's consumption behavior and habit will change um, and will continue to remain uh, as what it is now, more uh, consumption and more time spent on online. And this is how brands need to be uh, adjustable uh, to uh, of their strategies to really cater to um, the new era, um, I guess, after the COVID-19. Great. Okay, thanks very much. 
Okay, well, I think uh, for this, uh, well, I think you, you, you pretty much introduced this one, I guess. Um, because, I, yeah, I think that's, uh, that's okay. Uh, Peter, um, well, I, I think along the way we've understood, uh, you know, the, the, the growth of esports, definitely, uh, the impact that it, that it is making. It's never enough for professionals in the field, as we know, but definitely uh, there are lucky things happening from crisis. Um, so, uh, two things, actually. Has COVID-19 impacted consumer uh, engagement and the interests of brands and traditional media precisely for the esports business? And I think when it comes to also your core business uh, that can help the industry, there's definitely, I wouldn't say a debate, but questions about how to measure really uh, the impact, uh, the effectiveness of, of those uh, partnerships. So can you tell us more about that? Yeah, sure. Thanks. Uh, thanks very much. I think a, a key, uh, one of the elements in, the, in the, um, the cases that we saw before is that it's taken more than a year for big brands to execute to move into this space it's illustrative how how <clears throat> you know how careful brands are with their brand image or how how shy they are and how long it takes for an, uh, for a traditional company to start to understand what this space is and to define uh, an action and i hope going forward <clears throat> that also this period will accelerate the acceptance of gaming and 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 uh, increase the level of knowledge within these brands continuously instead of just just now and again uh, tapping their um, heads into it. Part of that is your last question. You know, we um, when we do campaigns, when we offer a streaming platforms for advertising around the esports, you know, we need to comply with the with the standards that are used that the traditional brands are used to when it comes to ROI. Uh, maybe even if we don't think that the methodology is as advanced as it should be or technically could be, we have to. Um, uh, yeah, make sure it fits nicely into uh, more traditional media strategies. So that's a, a, an important element, uh, barrier to take away. Um, one of the things that AJ touched on is that gaming is much more than, than, than a game. It's a lifestyle. Um, and I found it interesting just purely for, I have a couple examples of typical COVID related questions that we get and then try to sort out. What are the main motivations we found out for people to play more, spend more time playing games or even start playing again after they stopped? Is yet yeah, time, we get that, you have more time in your hands and what that's one of the, but to socialize. And I think, um, you know, a game like Fortnite, but actually all the competitive games as well, that they are a starting point for going online for a whole generation. Uh, maybe even more so in, in China, your games are a way an entry to meet people. Um, and once again, this period is accelerating insights, hopefully also to a broader audience that we already um, thought. And I think this is a good, uh, a good example. So it's not strange if you see on the next slide that the typical games that, that see a bigger boost in terms of gaming or viewership are the ones that have, uh, that have a lot of social aspects to it. <clears throat> so why not meet up with friends in a virtual open world like Grand Theft Auto or in Fortnite? watch a concert there like we recently saw in Fortnite, or just have a chat about regular things in life, but meanwhile, play around um, in a Grand Theft Auto environment, walk around the, the landscape as you would do uh, in a bar or walking around the city together. So I find it, one topic is just, um, I find interesting is the impact on different genres uh, of this period. And it teaches a lot about how, what the position is of games in people's lives. But if we go back to, if we go to the next slide, and back to the, the complexity for brands of entering in this space and others, you know, I think there's five phases. One is um, there's always champions within brands, but they need to convince a lot of people internally before things start to move. So we need to educate a lot. That's something that we do a lot. I think all panelists do a lot. And then secondly, what about the demographic? Does it really fit my brand? How much and, and, and which country uh, 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 skews? And then it's a big question, thirdly, is this a single marketing campaign? Is this a continuous thing? Are we going to develop a new product? We were involved with Danone, developing a completely new product uh, for this target group. After that, you get into this question, you know, which Melody uh, touched on, the complexity of defining the channels and how you use them. And um, in China, you know, streaming is even bigger than in the West, um, all these platforms, so you need to make smart choices about these uh, channels. 
and it's up to us to provide insights to make that um, easier. But on the next slide, you know, this, this period is accelerating, accelerating things. Um, the fact that the Formula One already was running their esports thing, but they simply shifted their focus to it in any, any, uh, almost any communication, led to a huge bump in, in, in viewership and respect. But as we saw with AJ slides as well, part of the equation, it, it's not only the game itself, it's famous people that play the game, that then stream it, that can add to the personal touch, uh, the celebrity, the fandom. And in traditional sports, they're finding out that digital platforms work very well for that. Um, Leclerc, the Ferrari driver, generated more viewing hours than the game itself. But if he starts streaming and talking about it, that's when things really start to excel. And this would have taken years for traditional successful sports leagues to find out. And it's all coming closer to all the things we saw around the LPL and other leagues um, in China. So on, on the next page, you can see an array of these initiatives that have been accelerated uh, coming from sports, traditional sports leagues, a game brand that's close to their uh, nature, and then having new initiatives and embracing um, the new streaming uh, world that we that we live in. Personally, I'm very interested in in what's going to happen, which illustrated on the next slide, and that's sports is very big in the in the in the physical space and stadiums. You know, an offline experience. Games is an online experience. But I think China will be the first to really show us what it means to have physical locations completely dedicated to gaming fandom and esports. And I think over 10 cities have, have set out efforts to be the, the esports and gaming hub of China. Of course, there'll be more. Uh, Wuhan is one of them. Wuhan hosts eStar Pro, which is their uh, champion in Honor of Kings mobile, uh, the most popular mobile uh, esports league. And they feel responsible to put Wuhan on the map, especially now after COVID. Um, and maybe for the experience in a physical way, gaming and esports will show how this will look like because they're just developing this and don't have to adjust stadiums uh, to the new situation. So I'm very curious to see how this pans out. And again, coming back to my first point, it also comes back to the responsibility that games companies feel to have people go outside and be fit, just as Nike made it part of their campaign. This is also part of it, bringing it into the real world. Mm -hmm. And Maybe to end, to end it off as time uh, runs out, you know, um, the most traditional league of all, the NFL in the US, on the next slide. Uh, it accelerates the, the, the realization that in certain target groups, esports and gaming already is, is becoming more popular um, than their own sport. So this put together with all the other things, I expect a lot of acceleration to happen and already um, a number of the biggest NFL sponsors have reached out to me, probably to AJ, maybe to Melody, to see what's up for future. And um, on the last side, you can see uh, a typical thing that is involved in the first phase. You know, the execs at these big leagues still don't want, realize um, how big this is, but they have to now as sports um, is temporarily paused. So just simply showing how big the overlap is, uh, how big the size of the prize is, is needed at this moment for the very first phase. And then hopefully more of these beautiful projects that Melody and AJ did will come to life as brands um, embrace this um, mm -hmm. that are currently stuck uh, in the first phase. I'm excited about the future and I, I'm excited to see how sports, media and games will accelerate to converge in in future, and I'm, I'm very happy to be part of that um, development. Great, fantastic. We are, and I guess, you know, uh, jumping on, on this one and, uh, and a quick talk that we had yesterday also with AJ, uh, the, the one also I'm very much curious about is the metaverse and what's happening in there. And, you know, singers, but then obviously probably also sports events. So we're just at the beginning of the story and metaverse is just, uh, I think, amazing. Um, well, thanks a lot uh, to uh, the three of you, uh, Melody, Ajay, and Peter. So we, let, let's move to, to, to the questions with the audience. Um, actually, there are still so, some people who can ask questions, but I, I'm going to start by the first, actually, and 
that's an obvious question and referring to you melody when you say you know i think you've been working on the with bmw something like three years to to come up with this partnership one of the question is precisely how long does it take really to, to think and produce you know a, a consistent partnership you know what's the time frame and probably also well i mean coming to budget it's always something that is kind of confidential but you know is, is there any sort of you know um yeah uh, ideas uh, that people should take into account and think of this is, a very, good, this is a very good question a very difficult question to answer um i guess all this um, sales colleagues in in marketing agencies are, are keen to, <laughs> to to know um, for 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 the period to get a brand on board actually varies uh, in different situations. Um, I would say maybe five to eight years ago, when more pandemic brands um, were interested in esports, meaning the computers the mouse, the esports chairs, all of those were pandemic, pandemic brands. For them to invest in and sponsor esports related sports assets were pretty natural decisions, but it was quite uh, difficult for us to approach and engage with non-pandemic brands, just like BMW, like Shell, like SAP, like uh, KitKat. Um, for them, it was a long educational process and a took a lot of consulting um, uh, suggestions to them uh, for them to really get to know what esports is and get to know the potential, huge potentials in consumer power uh, behind the uh, communities behind esports. And um, to answer this question in a very specific uh, way, for T1 and BMW, I'm not obliged to, to, to share more details, but there were a lot of bespoke and customized rights designed specifically for, for BMW, and that took a long time. Mm -hmm. I would say for BMW, it was a, a three-year journey for them to, to get a taste of what eSports like starting from three years ago back in 2017. And based on that successful partnerships, we were able to, to share with them uh, the potentials in embracing more in eSports starting um, I guess eight months ago. And that was a very singular case, but then for other brands, uh, partnerships with other esports clubs, it varies uh, very differently. I would just, um, yeah, say that. Thank you very much, Melody. I think you answer actually another question, which was, uh, and obviously it's the negative, but somehow is there a sort of, I wouldn't say SaaS platform, but you know, uh, customer, huh, is there a way to customize this working process precisely to, to, to come up with, you know, the, the, the requirements to, to, to go through, you know, and reach a, a certain type of partnership? Are there, you know, particular steps uh, that are today mandatory, but I, I guess you answered, and it's really based on a one-to-one -one approach, uh, specific problematics, etc. Yeah. Uh, I wouldn't say there are, for sure there are gonna be uh, very, how to say, certain steps for mm -hmm. a, uh, if we put it in a very simple way, for a salesperson to start uh, knocking on the door uh, to brands, but our, in our um, the world of business, we're dealing with people on a daily basis. Uh, the, br the brands that we're reach reaching out to are represented by people and also the sports IP, the T1, all other esports um, organizations like Peter and AJ mentioned, they were all comprised of people. So everyone has their different characteristics and different a way of approaches of presenting the opportunity. So it really varies. I would love to know an op <laughs> like automized approach um, um, in the sales world, but- It the, the, might the, the, help us somehow, some, somewhere. <laughs> okay, thank you, Melody. Uh, Ajay, I think maybe, uh, you know, something that is valid for the both of you, but Ajay, uh, you know, the hurdles, the main obstacles in bringing brands and, and game developers together. I mean, is there a way to, to, to say, you know, the top three main hurdles that you're facing or that you have to deal with to, to, to achieve those kind of partnerships? 
Yeah, I think Peter really articulated it, I guess, if you're looking at a process. And I think everything starts with when I'm speaking to clients, when I'm speaking to potential clients with with the teams that we have across Asia, it's, okay, um, can you get us into esports? How do, how do we navigate the esports landscape? And I think that's really the first the process. And I think simplifying what this landscape is, and I think just defining that esports is just a competitive side of playing casual games and then understanding that then you go on the next, okay, great. If I'm playing Candy Crush, or if I'm playing Animal, animal Crossing for four hours a day um, with my family, that's not necessarily considered an esport. So, okay, wh where's the position for your brand around that? But also ultimately, how do you navigate that ecosystem? So. I think what brands need to understand that is if you are at the first stage of that process of navigating that ecosystem, there's only a few people and organizations actually make money out of games. And those are the people that own the IP and develop the games themselves. When you're talking about in the traditional world of sponsorships or partnerships, where a lot of the traditional sports leagues have been making a lot of their money through broadcasting and licensing, all that, that, that stage is where I would say bracket competitive esport or competitive video game or esports, that is kind of like a drop in the ocean of just revenue being generated. And there's not actually a lot of sophisticated ways to market through that platform because the developers themselves and the owners of the IP don't necessarily know how to work with brands. And the brands, again, they don't know how to navigate that ecosystem. So hence why there's a massive opportunity in the market for, for one, the education element, but also to, to develop your own niche. So I think once you really have again, to what Peter said, you have an internal champion, whether that's the CEO, whether that's the CMO, so you know what, we need to go out and own this space and we need to do it for the long term as opposed to on a campaign basis. That's when you can become a lot more entrepreneurial with these different partners in the ecosystem. And I think one of the main hurdles is the fact of transparency in the market because there isn't necessarily a marketplace to see what there is available all the way from um, a tournament all the way from new IP coming into the market, specifically new video games, new mobile titles from different developers, all the way through to the guys who are content creators, guys who are, have their own communities, the micro communities in different markets, which are important for regional brands. So I think having transparency for, if you're again, brand, if you're an IP holder to see, okay, great. I have a specific problem that can be solved through a, a potential partner. I think that is what is lacking globally and not just necessarily unique to Asia. Um, and I think that is, those are the key key hurdles that we tend to like encounter. But again, that those are massive opportunities because we don't necessarily see people playing in that space from an advisory point of view. Okay, I, I think one last question. Uh, actually, I guess every one of you can, can answer it. And I think it's, the, the momentum is great for that. Um, there's always been a, a gender issue and gap uh, regarding as much the players and the audience when it comes to esports. And I remember that uh, with attending the League of Legends, etc. And now that we have also in a luxury groups coming into the field, I think that's a, a good question. How do you see this evolve? Uh, I guess, Peter, you've got the data and, and you two, uh, Melody and Ajay, probably also have this concern, you know, what, what, how much do we target women? Uh, how many are they to, 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 to watch and play? Uh, go ahead. Uh, Ajay first or... Well, we, we should watch out that, but, uh, you know, gamers themselves don't maybe really see this as a, as a thing because there's... First of all, there's a lot more. There's a lot more. There's 50 percent of the gamers in the world are, are ladies. It's exactly 50, 50 percent. So when we talk about this, it's about uh, perhaps the people that go to stadiums to see highly competitive shooting games skew more male. But even then, you would be surprised that a quarter of that core 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 group is is female. So we should watch out to to create too much of a um, <clears throat> a black and white um, picture here, and and also. To respect gamers because there's there's already so many female female gamers we don't have indeed a female professional league which only after 50 years of existence has started a couple of years ago for the nba you know and hopefully it won't take us as, uh, as many years as that um but yeah we have to um um you know we, we have to 
watch out to, to, to stigmatize. But we also have to motivate and stimulate, of course, of it being a completely equal playing field and be a leader in that as we're a leader in other mechanics and, um, and in <clears throat> being very, um, you know, the communities are very open and outspoken and very transparent. And, and I think that's, um, uh, yeah. we should let the community lead us in, in how we can help them help have equal opportunities. It's a difficult question, but we shouldn't over overstress it or overact. I think, but uh, maybe the other people have something uh, smarter to say. Perfect. Anything you want to add, Adjie or Melody? It's yeah, okay. I think, from my perspective, of just going to competitions and going to events, and depending on the title, it really depends on the audience. So I go to uh, Honor of Kings or Wang Zhurong Yao event in Shanghai. I would say it's 70%, 30% skewed towards females. If I go to a Dota 2 like TI last year, it's probably 80% guys who probably play it in college. And I think the, the reasons why people follow a specific game, again, it is really related to do I play it or do I, do, am I attracted to the culture around that specific game? Is it the specific players themselves? So I think anecdotally, I think brands and anyone will be remiss just to say you know what it's just a nerd's game and it's for guys who sit in their houses and they don't necessarily socialize and i think that is some that generally is the stigma but the massive opportunity is is that it's an even playing field for any person to enter so it's generally agnostic if you are a male or a female and i think that's what is really the exciting part about that and i think just bringing that bringing that insight and fact uh, through just like first first-hand insights and experiences is really being powerful when you're talking to clients because they well I didn't realize that 70% 80% of people watching this live stream are actually females um, mm -hmm. you don't necessarily pay China is showing us the way a little bit there China is, is 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 has a higher share of female real game fans as it is more part of their culture I think okay and Melody does BMW think that they're gonna get more female <laughs> car drivers and, and, and jobbers I don't know I don't know what's the speech actually. I wanted to add up um, on Peter's point, just to give you a live example. So at the end of last year, when uh, we invited Faker and Teddy from T1 to Shanghai into our office, literally, um, I, I, I was so surprised to see so many female coworkers and actually people from other offices on the same floor, like all all like uh, flooded in our office to just to see Baker. And uh, you could not imagine how many female fans were lined up, just trying mm -hmm. to line up just to see Faker to get a signature uh, b b before the start of the meet and greet. I would say uh, from a fan, um, fan uh, perspective, female um, fans, they are more expressive than male, uh, male fans. And I would say brands uh, in maybe luxuries and cosmetics, or even in BMW could really try to look into that and leverage that. But the female consumption power is huge. Um, and they, they, they're not afraid to express um, their, their fandom and their love for their idols. I guess that's a good conclusion. <laughs> Thanks very much. Uh, well, Peter, Ajay, uh, Melody, thank you for uh, your contribution. Thank you for your advices and uh, points of view. Uh, thank you all for uh, joining us today. The replay, the audio play as well, and the PDF of the presentation will be shared later this afternoon. Also, once you, you disconnect, uh, we send you right away a link for a very quick survey. I mean, really would appreciate to get your feedback. It's important um, so that we, we can, you know, un understand what, what you like and what you can expect as well for the future. Uh, and in our next slides, please. Uh, I would like, uh, yes, to, to also announce. So next week, uh, we're going to dig a little bit further uh, into e-commerce and the live stream business. Uh, actually, with uh, the exclusive you know, contribution now of Pinduoduo and Alfilo Brands, uh, who is representing a lot of uh, cultural institutions from museums, galleries, etc., who is also, because of the COVID and uh, thanks to the COVID accelerating into uh, uh, how to leverage actually live stream to, to, to sell and connect with, uh, with the followers. So next slide as well, Anina. And for all of you who want also to, to follow us, uh, China Connect, you can scan these QR codes. 
so we see you next week, same day, Wednesday, same time, 11 a.m., I would say in France and around in the UK for 10 a.m., 5 p.m. China. Thank you again uh, to everybody and, uh, and see you then. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Guys, cheers. Bye.